Thank, thank you very much for your kind invitation. And I'll just try to introduce this conversation by uh, sharing some, some ideas with you with the two arts you mentioned, uh, academic art and also as being the founder of Along Our Borders, who is deploying a portable cultural center for the most disadvantaged population of the world, starting with the refugees, but also in France, in the United States, in Australia. So on, not only uh, in the, the, uh, for population displaced, but for the most disadvantaged population in our Western countries. Let's start, first of all, with two academic references. Uh, I read uh, very recently the last book of a very famous sociologist called Norbert Elias. I don't know if you have heard of this impressive sociologist who has uh, been considered as someone of the founding father of the School of Vienna in the, uh, by the French history that is diffused all over the world. And he, his last book is called Theory of Symbols. And it's a very basic concept I would like to share with you. He says, human beings differ from animals for one thing. They have a language that is permanently in creation. Animals have language, but it's the same language transmitted generation after generation. The human beings in the only animal who create different languages and accumulate within the different languages, knowledge, ideas, experience, words through words, through terms, and it is so. The consequence of that is that language, literature, what we make with words, is what we what make us human. It should be considered as the first human right to be able to access education, culture, should be considered as the first human right. That's what is my NGO philosophy. So now, I would like to shift to another sociologist, Emil Durkheim. Emil Durkheim is a sociologist of you know, how to integrate people in social in the social frame, and he noticed in his famous book about the division of labor, in his, the introduction of his book, he said some people don't interpret the division of labor, either because they choose to, de to keep or to develop their <coughs> difference, their cultural difference, and that's an absolute right to do that, but also because they are ejected. They are ejected from the access to the general citizenry or general frame of living. And I take for this comment, this, which is in, the, in his introduction, that diversity could be both ways. You can have the chosen diversity. Every of us have a personal identity. This personal identity can be connected to more collective and group identity. And it should be our choice to express it, to develop it, to make it part of more part of ourselves in our daily life. But some of us are constrained to express identity that you didn't choose to express. For example, you have the movement Black Lives Matter. Probably they, should, they would love not to have to be existed, not to have to be created. If they were created, is to resist Black Lives killing and to fight against that. And so you could say that's the expression of diversity. It's a constrained diversity. It's not a chosen diversity. And so, in my short presentation, I will try to, because you have this diversity, <coughs> you would like not to be, 
force to explain, to, ex to express. It's like, you know, Sartre defined anti-Semitism as uh, the Jews defined by non-Jews, by the anti -Semitism. Well, you can say some Jews love to be defined by transmission of Judaism through families. That's the one they choose, and they should not be forced to define themselves by resisting to racism or to semitism. And so you have always that, that dual dimension in identity. And I would like to develop a few thoughts about that. First of all, in France, like in the United States, some group don't deserve full recognition as compatriots or as citizens. And I would say, to make a rough comparison that will probably will be criticized by the panelists, that in the United States, to, to make it roughly, you have basic rights that are not shared by all citizens, and that make the life of minorities, who are the poorest part of the population, extremely difficult. Today, in the New York Times, there is an article of a friend of mine, Pamela Druckerman, who is living in France, and she is speaking about the anxiety of being a mother in the United States. And being a mother in a poor family is even more, providing more anxiety because, of course, access to school, to, to, to uh, day, daily uh, care, uh, daycare, to, to school at the age of two or three, uh, to school who receives subsidies at a very low level because you, you are living in a poor area and the subsidies to the school depend on the value of the property you are. As in France, the, the, value, the subsidy is equal. Wherever, uh, so all that could be changed by having a more equal respect of all citizens by providing them the basic access to right that we make their kids uh, 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 access, <coughs> provide access to education, to culture, to internet, the same way that the more the middle class or upper middle class kids have. In the city of New York, 20% of the inhabitants don't have internet. And where do they go? They go to the public library, if they can because it's a, it's a place where they can access to the, what has become a basic right. So that is something that I think in the f near future, in, if you want to permit kids of the poorest family to access basic rights, this kind of approach should be developed, even if it's, of course, more an individual cultural dimension that I emphasize here, but I, let me give you an example. We were in the Bronx with, the, with this uh, ideas box, and what we discovered? That the adolescents, they don't have CVs. They don't have CVs because they think they don't deserve a CV, because they have never had a paid job. So after 40 minutes of discussion with people of our team, they get out with a CV, printed. The pride you could feel, the feeling of happiness, that they could show a CV, something they have done for all their life. That was a basic thing. There's nothing to do with their race. It has something to do with poverty, with not access to the to basic rights. And so I think that is more better done in France than in the US, but now let's move to France, where I think something is much less well done, is confrontation with our history. Uh, I feel that in my country, the crisis we have is that people don't feel compatriot. Some French citizens think they don't recognize the country where they were raised and born, and they vote for National Front. And some others say, I'm French, but I'm not recognized as such. And the proof of that they are not recognized as such 
I can I develop it in my most recent book, The Sons of the Republic, where, for example, I show that some, the most famous historian of France attacked a bill that was passed by the parliament called the Taubira Bill that recognized slavery as a crime against humanity, saying it's an imposition on our history by a group, the memory of a group, so the cultural the identity of a group. They didn't know that the French parliament has recognized slavery as a crime against humanity in 1794 and has punished it with a special penalty which was deprivation of citizenship for the slave owner or slave trader. Why didn't they know? Because they don't care about this part of French history. It's not part of the European France. It's part of the former colonies. But it's still France. And if it was more known, then our compatriots were coming from these former colonies, or colonies were become full territory of France Republic, would feel recognized more than they are. And they are not recognized as such. And in the most recent and Review, uh, survey that has been made, a very recent survey has been made on the Muslim of France. Everybody talked about this survey. I read it. They wanted to show their knowledge of history, so they made a story of Muslim in France, and I type, type, check one word, war. 15 times it appears. Never the Algerian. Was First World War, Second World War, war against Daesh. The Algerian war is as structured and still structured. <coughs> Some of the major mechanisms for which we are fighting each other in my country, we fought on the Algerian war. Five categories of French have still their family memory related to Algeria. And now that we are fighting for who we are, they think that we are reproducing in today France what has happened 15 years ago in Algeria. And you have this report from the main foundation neglecting a key moment that is a moment where we should talk about we should talk, we should teach the history of slavery, of colonization, as to make our compatriot coming from that history part of the full citizen. So to go to, to, so that is very important because otherwise you keep this, you say, okay, they are great, they are great soccer player, they can play certain role, they can be some certain kind of artist, of singers, but not full citizen being able to choose their future as an artist or as an astronaut or whatever, as full citizen part of uh, our common history. So I don't want to continue long because I want to hear more the people of the panel. What I just want to say is that we have to fight, to fight for. The first fight is to fight for more equality. Uh, the one I was mentioning, speaking of the Bronx, which also could be in a, is an issue in France, but less than the United States. And the one I was mentioning about France, which is the recognition of groups through their part of in French history, so that people could choose. When you tell a French compatriot to look like being from North Africa, you say he's a Muslim. Who, how do you know? It is his or her choice to say, I am a Muslim. Not the choice, it should not be the choice of the French institution. We never did that for any other group. We don't say, you are a Catholic every, in the everyday life. What should we start? We did it under the colonization in Algeria. And, we continue, and now we are resuming doing that. It's terrible. The choice should be, yes, I am a Muslim if I want to be. I am from North Africa if I want to be. I am a, a, a singer if I want to be. And that is 
the church we should offer uh, uh, f uh, to everybody to express their culture the way, the way they want. So let me end by saying the following things. Cultural creation is a way of fighting the two fights. The fight for more equality and the fight for expressing what is your will to be, how you want to be uh, 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 represented towards the other. Why that? Because, and I, I come back to Elias, language and language creation is the, is the fundamental uh, human rights and human capacity. And because we have to convince in this country and in my country and in many countries a majority to change their way, to accept to pay more here, to accept to recognize more in France, one of the only ways to do it is to create empathy, to create the possibility of connection towards people who look, who, who have a prejudice. And often, I would say, it has been the history of, of uh, women's rights, it has been the history of fighting against slavery, often through artistic creation, through books you read and surprise you because it introduces you in the life of people you have never heard of or you have never imagined like that. It is through creation that you break the barriers and you create a new majority that will permit to win this battle we need to fight together. Thank you very much. Slats. I'm the moderator for today's conversation. Um, I want to start by first thanking Patrick Vey for that uh, stirring intervention and keynote. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to Louis Chopra, um, Simon, and all of the team um, at the Alliance Française. Um, as Louis mentioned, I'm currently, uh, and oh, before all of you for being here, certainly, um, on this beautiful day. And of course, these four uh, distinguished panelists um, who I'll have a chance to introduce in a second. Um, so, as Lily mentioned, um, I'm currently uh, an associate curator at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York of Media and Performance Art. Previously, I was a curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem, which is an institution founded in 1968 uh, to show, interpret, and collect work of art by artists of African descent. Um, so these questions in many ways are at the core of how I understand my work in the world, both professionally and otherwise. Um, and in many ways I've had the privilege not to have to justify or articulate why these questions matter. Um, they just are our everyday um, forms of life. Um, and I hope that at my, you know, my position at MoMA, um, I can continue to do that, and I feel I have been able to, and I'm thrilled to be joined by folks who I think share that sense of priority, that what we're doing um, in terms of this conversation isn't a one-off, it isn't au courant, it isn't something that's topical, it's a continuation of a you know, lifelong set of commitments. Um, so I'll, I'll start off by just putting out a few terms on the table. I think much of what we'll do today will be about thinking through how language and discourse has effects. Um, and so I think we want to both kind of be specific about the language that we're using. Um, but simultaneously, I think we want to talk about the impact of that language. Um, so just to give an opener for what that looks like, I wanted to define this idea of cultural equity, um, which had enough of an allure for all of you to come here. So I think we all might have a kind of different notion of what that means, and I'll propose one. Um, so equity um, is 
I'm proposing, um, an aim for fair and impartial treatment that acknowledges the lack of privilege necessary to participate fully. Um, and so that, that acknowledgement is where equity differs from equality. Um, in that, if equality ensures that people are treated equally or similarly with parity, um, then what, where equity comes in is a kind of analysis um, and a real investigation to understand why people are not. And I think it's that imperative um, to, to look at that gap um, that makes that differentiation. Um, in terms of culture, I'll give a very broad definition of culture. Um, we were talking earlier about you know, how does culture differentiate itself from politics, um, differentiate itself from economics. So I'll say culture is synonymous with subsistence. Um, it's the thing that we do that gives us life. And um, it's an arena for elaboration, right? It's, this, it's the field in which we, um, we can elaborate our sense of collectivity um, and relationship to one another. Um, and when these two terms come together, culture and equity, um, we can say that culture needs to be more equitable, but I think we're actually saying something more fundamental here. I think we're saying that culture is the space in which that demand to understand why there is this gap occurs. It's the field in which contestation happens. Hashid earlier used the word battleground, and I think we can say that culture certainly is a battleground today. Um, to give just two brief examples of kind of controversy, um, we can think about recently in St. Louis, the Contemporary Art Museum, where the show of Kelly Walker um, caused um, a kind of outcry as a result of the use of images um, that Andy Warhol took um, from the early 1960s of race riots um, that resulted um, in a protest from members of the staff of the Contemporary Art Museum. Um, eventually, uh, there was a kind of moment of, of actual violence um, at a gas station where uh, a member of the staff was attacked, um, and recently the chief curator of the museum left. Um, there's one moment of, of the battleground really taking, taking its, its, um, its toll. Um, in, a, in a French context, just to have a little bit of parody in the name of, 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 of equity, um, the recent exhibition, um, The Color Line at Cape Honi, um, came under serious attack uh, because of the way in which the, um, the booklet, the program, um, described the lifestyle of slaves as, as um, being pleasant. And um, that, you know, for various reasons was seen as not only inaccurate but offensive. Um, and so I think to look at these two, we see the way in which in our moment, so much of this question of cultural equity isn't only urgent, but actually um, is, in a sense, is in a state of crisis. And I think hopefully what we do today by looking at um, a few different anecdotes, a few different um, key sites that um, our panelists have, have devoted themselves to, we can think through um, these terms that are on the one hand urgent, but also deserve um, to have the field cleared a little bit. So I've asked um, the, the three panelists, um, and Isabel who's translating today for us, um, to one, um, think through and conceptualize an idea of diversity and discrimination in their work, and then offer a couple of examples or anecdotes um, that animate what they do. And so they'll speak for uh, about five minutes, and then we'll open it up to a conversation. Um, so without further ado, I will pass the proverbial mic um, to you, Zeba Haman, um, to, to speak a little bit about your work as a senior program officer for Building Bridges um, at the Doris Duke Foundation here in New York. to what you said about, in, in terms of your definitions, and so also what Patrick said, is that um, culture really defines us, it's, uh, it forms our core identity. And from that, we have an approach to life, um, and it really, um, it shapes our thinking, and uh, it gives us uh, a means to act. And um, I, the two things I want to say today, one is that I've had more than 20 years of experience in the field as a cultural producer, and now I'm at the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, um, basically supporting cultural projects. And in particular, my program, which is called Building Bridges, 
looks at um, projects that use arts and culture to create social cohesion between um, US-based Muslims and non-Muslims. So it's community focused and it's uh, focused on really knitting together our social fabric because our benefactor, Doris Duke, was very interested in the well-being of Americans. So that's the, the basis from which my program acts. And we do so by supporting projects in arts and culture. And um, I would like to bring up two examples that we've currently supported. One is um, with the Somali refugee community in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood of Minneapolis. Some of you may know that it's on the Department of Justice's uh, list of three um, cities um, that are vulnerable to recruitment from absolutists, Islamic ab absolutists, fundamentalists, uh, and they have their own program uh, that they've implemented. And we have a project that we're supporting called Minimo, which is focused on Somali music. And what it does is, um, through its two partners, the Cedar Cultural Center and um, Augsburg College, which is a small private university, um, together they have used um, music to really draw together um, the Somali refugee population and um, the non-Muslim non population, which and both are far, far apart. They don't interact at all. Um, and it's a very fraught environment. So um, what's, what's happened in terms of addressing inequality um, on the community level in practice, um, this has really galvanized both communities. They've uh, created a house band of uh, Augsburg College uh, music students under the direction of a former music chair of, of their department and Somali musicians from the community. And they are the backing band that then uh, performs with vocalists from um, the Somali diaspora in Somalia. So it's become a very, very um, uh, highly lauded, respected project because it's been really effective. And in effect, it is also uh, come onto the radar of policymakers in the U.S. because they're looking for models that are, are working. Right? So, so that's one example that I thought is, is very concrete and has had really tangible results and they're looking to scale it into other parts of, of Minnesota. Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, let's move um, to you, Rashid, um, and as well, um, to talk a little bit from your perspective, which I think is important here because you're at once an artist and a choreographer, um, but also are the director of an institution um, in Grenoble, the National Choreographic Center, um, and um, have been working um, with Pierrot's, and we'll hear a little bit about that partnership um, as part of Premier Act. Um, and so, can you speak a little bit about um, these questions from your position? Yeah. Uh, yeah, first uh, I would like to apologize. Isabel is here. If you don't understand what I'm saying, just make a sign and she will start to translate. <coughs> I'd like to do my best. Uh, but yeah, I prefer to try in English. Um, yeah, about culture. Uh, I think that the, more, the first thing that I understood after 20 years of practicing different kind of art in different fields, working with different communities, communities that we can define through their culture, through their ethnia, through their social classes, through the, the traumatism they cross, victim of torture, different communities. I think all with their own culture. Um, and, after, and after so many years of different programs in France to try to to valorize what we called a cultural diversity with all those programs that we're trying to, yeah, to, to show how diverse we are. After all that, we are, at the moment, we are just making the, the constant. We are just realizing that all that is not efficient at all, but at all. It's even worse than before. 
um, then that's why now what I'm trying to do in cultural field, it's not anymore to recognize the culture of someone. It's these mobile things, which is a process going on. What is the culture of a refugee, but, but from an elite, or, or the culture of a, a local French person, but because he's black, he's considered, he's still seen as a foreigner, even if he's here from four, I mean, even if his family is in France from 200 years. All those issues, I just gave up. And I'm ju just trying to, to notice mechanism that reproduce a complex of white su superiority in France. A mechanism that reproduce a culture with Euro-centered science and um, and yeah that's why i um, I, will, I wanted to speak about this program called premier act that we are doing with uh, edmond rothschild foundations at the moment and with two other theater the national uh, National Theatre of La Colline, uh, National Theatre of Strasbourg, and, uh, and US National Geographic Center of Grenoble. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's a program where uh, we, we, uh, we decide to, because we all notice that theatre in, in France is mainly white, we just wanted to, to force some things, and there is this promotion of students, and they are all issue from what we call uh, cultural diversity, and victim of discrimination. Because it's true that we don't mention that a lot, but it was one of the criteria when we took them. Um, and uh, the idea is just to, to put them in a network. The network of train because if you if the schools are only white for different reasons or for um, uh, for self uh, self censorship uh, just because you self censorship because you do believe that this is not for you because for many reasons um, it means that the schools are white and then it means that the actors are white and it means that the theater maker are working with white people. Because I do not, how I said before, after 50 years of different program, I don't think that all those generous people in France are racist or, or they practice an, an active discrimination. It's just a passive discrimination that we have to psychoanalyze through our programs. And, um, and just this example, I'll try to make it short, uh, and just this example to to, to say that we, we have an economical uh, mechanism in France, which is that if you come from one of the high uh, theater school, as soon as you start to work, half of your salary is taken in charge by the school. Then, and I know all the theater make at the moment, what they want is, is to be able to make a production, economically speaking, and they do not care if, uh, uh, if they are in an academic register. If Romeo is black or Arabic, they will take it. If he's good, and if there is, and if he's, uh, and especially if they can make an economy, uh, then that's the kind of thing that I, I was trying to say, like trying to locate mechanism that reproduce a certain culture, and that's at the moment the way to twist the neck uh, and to finally start to develop a collective imaginary because that's the goal, because if you go to see plays, if you see writers, if you if you see performance, uh, we'll just stay in the field of uh, live art. All our common references are going to be much more diverse in a way. Um, I hope. It's a, it's a real question, because recently I got some analysis, and it's true that in dance field, there is much more diversity on stage, but it didn't really create a diversity in the audience. Then it's one step, but it has to be combined with many other things. Then that's it. Let's try to create this collective imaginary, much more diverse. Thank you so much for that, Rashid. Um, I'll pass the mic to Firoz Ladakh, who is the CEO of the Edmund de Rothschild Foundation um, and based in Paris currently. Yes. Thanks. Um, Good evening and thank you for being here. Um, 
A few points. So, uh, as you mentioned, um, I actually oversee what is a bit of a strange animal, uh, which is actually a network of, uh, of about 10 foundations under the uh, uh, Rothschild uh, umbrella. Uh, and it so happens that uh, we have a foundation in Paris and we have one in New York. So, uh, it's always been extremely interesting for me to um, do this back and forth between France more broadly and New York, because I certainly wouldn't claim that I know anything else in the US besides uh, New York where we are um, uh, present. Diversity for us um, hasn't been really geared towards any specific program, but is actually an overarching uh, value. So whether we are in the arts or in entrepreneurship or in health, um, it has become a core feature of what we are trying to harness, promote, uh, develop as a basic uh, tool and solution for what we believe is uh, you know, society's good and, and, and future, and which is certainly counter the type of tendencies we see on both sides of the Atlantic today. Uh, and frankly speaking, when we're discussing about that, sometimes you know we're looking at health or in business or in culture. I wouldn't say that culture fares very well when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to uh, diversity in terms of, as you said, those who attend, not the public, uh, and those who perform. And this is how this whole idea of uh, premier act that uh, uh, Rashid uh, uh, mentioned uh, came about. It just came from a very simple anecdote. Uh, you know, I so happened to, um, to be lucky uh, to have fallen in love with uh, a woman from New York uh, who um, happens to be from uh, Pakistani origin. And uh, she came with me to Avignon, which is, as probably most of you know, the most famous uh, French uh, theatre festival uh, in the world. And we had a discussion with some fairly well to do famous uh, directors on the French scene who were precisely talking about these issues of uh, you know how important it is to promote diversity. And then so she turned around and said that. I'm sorry, but everybody is very blonde, you're very white, I don't see any diversity. And um, there was a sort of big silence. My wife is wonderful, it was quite straightforward. And, uh, and, but it certainly gave uh, that push towards uh, who has been behind this program. There was a friend of uh, Stanislas Norte, who used to be an artist at La Colline, which is one of the uh, French national theatre and who has now taken over the, uh, the school and the theater in Strasbourg to basically uh, start this, uh, this fight, which initially actually didn't make people at ease, including yourself. Remember, we talked about it. Uh, you know, these issues of diversity in France are not as obvious as they might be in the US um, for various reasons. First of all, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the whole issue of diversity in this country comes from the civil rights movements to uh, women's rights, to gay rights, to uh, this whole idea of hyphenated identities, and now religion, and of course, the big Muslim question, which you, which you touched on. Uh, in France, it's been a totally different story. You know, it's, it's the, 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 the very idea of hyphenated identity is generally not accepted. You're French or you're not. Uh, it so happens that today there are you know, second tier and third tier and fourth tier French citizens. Um, and so the third generation, those who came from Algeria, who are now third or fourth generation, actually feel even less French than their parents or their grandparents felt when they came primarily from North Africa or, or, or elsewhere. And there's, we notice in France today that there's a sort of cry for being recognized as more than just, je suis français. Uh, and that has actually led a lot of, um, um, uh, you know, this generation, I would say those who are in the sort of 20s or 25, to start really seeking other forms of uh, identities, which generally in France are not permitted. Uh, and the whole idea of diversity also has to be defined in France against the state, which perhaps is less dogmatic in the US as compared to France, for again, a history which is the history of the French Republic, which, which had its own foundation and legitimacy, but where basically your identity is also very much defined within a, a legal and historical context where especially um, uh, the state has very strongly uh, you know, um, um, uh, promoted the whole idea of laicity, as we all know. 
and, and diversity, laicity are becoming terms now that are becoming closer and, and closer because of religion starting to play a very strong role now in the whole diversity uh, e equation. <coughs> All this to say that uh, we as a, as, a, as a group of foundations have decided to go beyond just um, um, sponsoring programs, but really taking a stand, and, uh, which in America is perhaps a bit more frequent, where some foundations engage into policy. In France or in Europe, the foundations don't have the same type of power they have in America. So, uh, but now that the state, the welfare state is starting to weaken, of course we as foundations can start taking a bit more, more, uh, more space. And I'm glad to hear what the Doris Duke Foundation is doing, which is from a program, it's becoming a, a, a policy. So I, I would say just to conclude that actually, um, as, as, as it was mentioned um, uh, before, diversity uh, can be imposed on you. Uh, diversity can certainly uh, be an opportunity, and it, uh, it certainly we believe it should be, especially uh, in what the world is, uh, is facing today. And diversity uh, is not necessarily where you find it, in other words, where you think you'll find it. So for instance, we find that there's actually more diversity in areas like entrepreneurship, for instance. So there's a great program, and I see a, a great one of mine who is here, who is managing this program, which basically brings together social entrepreneurs uh, who are uh, Jews and Muslims. So this is more about diversity amongst each other, and also conflict resolution to communities that usually don't necessarily are being perceived as liking each other. Um, I see a, a, a quest there for meritocracy, for uh, success, for uh, for moving ahead, somewhat more convincing than sometimes what I see uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in culture. And just to conclude one last point, when we took the risk in France of launching Premier Act, we took a legal risk, because in France, as you probably know, we cannot engage in poverty discrimination. It's forbidden by law. So who are we with a name as visible as Rothschild to go into that stand and really you know, be, become um, uh, exposed we decided to go the discrimination route. So we said, anybody who can claim that, as a, as a young actor in theater, who can claim that has been victim to some form of discrimination, can apply. Well, it so happened that the first year, the only ones who applied were either from African American or Arab origin. Which, basically, which to conclude, means that in France, discrimination means facies. Because we had, you know, for instance, uh, you know, discrimination was beyond the color, right? Because so that's also very interesting in France how, in many ways, discrimination has really started to funnel, tune people into purely the way they appear. Thank you. No, thank you so much, Philo. That's fantastic. I'm going to start with both of you guys, Philo and Zeba, since we have the opportunity to have two um, cultural workers who are working directly in foundations um, to think about questions of impact and outcomes. I know that those are words that you guys like. I don't know anything about those things. I work in you know, a museum where you know, we just think all the time. I'm being sarcastic. Um, and I guess my question, you know, say what you talked about um, in terms of method, in terms of you know, this question of what do we do, right? Um, a way in. You talked about scaling up um, and the way in which the work that you're doing could be a kind of model that is then practiced in other fields of culture or in other kinds of social arenas altogether. Um, and feel those, I think that, you know, you emphasize the, the role of advocacy, of kind of taking a position publicly. Um, and clearly your work ongoingly with Hashid and with others here um, puts in a, a, a kind of underline around the idea of partnerships. Um, can I ask you guys your opinions about other methods? Let's say quotas. Um, let's say um, insisting on leadership, um, that the leadership of certain organizations, which even we've seen within cultural orgs, as they shift their demographics um, in terms of race um, and ethnicity, oftentimes you know, the kind of echelons of board and director and, and chief curators remains the same. Um, in terms of questions of mentorship, um, you know, that there's a, there's a way in which uh, people are in the field but not necessarily being supported in the field. Um, so can you, you know, within some of those key strategies that are in some ways contested, talk a little bit about your opinions of what works and um, what's troubling? <coughs> so just so I, I um, get all the points you want us to cover, the first is 
I guess question of um, of method. method. Um, yeah, yeah. The primarily method. You know, of of those. What's what's the priority in terms of addressing these um, issues that folks here who are looking for a kind of takeaway we can offer them now and then get it out of the way and talk about anything we want to talk about. So method and then uh, inequality actually in within organizations. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, in terms of, of, I mean, that's a really broad question. <laughs> um, in the U.S., uh, since we're a national funder, um, I would say that uh, there are several ways in which philanthropy is supporting different initiatives. There are experiments, um, and then there are um, actual strategies that each program has. and. Um, I find that, that some of the experiments are very, very interesting. That's where we take our risk. Because really, what is philanthropy but uh, impact investing, um, in a way, right? Where uh, investing uh, for social good or change um, for the better. And um, I, I found that there, there are several very, very interesting projects that um, colleagues are supporting, I'm thinking particularly of a pop justice um, project, um, which is taking shape and um, is bringing together different um, uh, fund peer funders. Um, and it's based on the premise that the media has a really strong role to play, that entertainment has a really strong role to play in um, promoting stereotypes, whether it's yellow face, or brown face, or black face. Um, and that its, um, its reach is really far, very far, it's global, uh, particularly given the digital space. So th this, is, this is really an area that is of great interest um, you know, for, for those of us who are in culture. And we've been holding a lot of conversations about how we can support um, you know, through uh, pop culture to correct um, stereotypes and perceptions. Uh, if you want me to go deeper, I can, or, or if you want me to move to the next point, I can do that. Um, I like <coughs> mm. In terms of, of um, uh, the lack of diversity in organizations here in the U.S., I, I'd say at, at the very top of my mind is, is the lack of diversity within the philanthropic community, um, which is um, very gender dominated, uh, um, quite male in terms of leadership, and uh, although in the rank and file there are, there are a lot of women, um, and in terms of actual racial and ethnic diversity, it's it's uh, kind of monolithic. Um, in our foundation, which is a very progressive foundation, there is actually a great great consciousness about this, and um, we are very deliberately um, hiring. Um, those who are differently abled um, and um, definitely with a focus on gender and also in terms of ethnic diversity. So I'm very pleased to say that there is a shift, I would also say, in um, other philanthropies like Ford and uh, Open Society Foundation also. Um, but in terms of uh, diversity within cultural organizations, um, there is a similar pattern where it has been um, really uh, gender dominated by men in terms of leadership. And it is much the talk um, in the cultural community here in the US. Um, in fact, there um, is a move particularly amongst the theater makers um, to address this. Um, and, and you may know about this already. Um, I was just at, at the Consortium of Asian American Theatre Artists <coughs> in Oregon. They uh, have an annual conference. And um, when they uh, think about Asian American, they're primarily thinking about East Asians. And to correct that, they have actually expanded um, their definition and, and their outlook to include um, Central, West, and South Asians. Um, very recently, and also Middle Eastern diaspora. Um, to, uh, because uh, within the US, as you very well pointed out, uh, the immigrant community, um, you know, we are very conscious of the immigrant community and, and um, the struggles um, 
you know, from the very beginning. Um, so this network is um, very actively mobilizing uh, theater makers to, to change that to, in two ways. One, to change the, the focus of theater making, to include actors and other stakeholders um, in, in the, the process of um, theater making nationally, uh, but also in terms of organizationally. I'll stop here. Justin. So, um, just add one, one or two points, uh, and again, it comes purely from my own personal uh, experience having, been, having traveled back and forth between New York and, and Paris for the last uh, 10 years. Um, uh, I grew up partly in Canada, and it is true that Canada is being seen, especially with uh, our new Prime Minister, as uh, <coughs> Canada is back, and, and certainly uh, does promote diversity in a way that not many countries do. They, call more, they talk more about cultural mosaic, as you know, as compared to the U.S. model, which is an alpha plot. Um, but during the dark years of Canada, when Stephen Harper was in power for about 10 years, of course, we looked at uh, America, and uh, as America under Obama, which created this incredible uh, overturn worldwide, uh, that, that anything was possible, that America was representing again uh, a dream. During that period, um, it's true that I had a, a very biased, um, a biased opinion in favor uh, of uh, the U.S. and again New York, because I would I would see more representation of diversity in the media on TV uh, as as compared to to France, uh, because I felt that. Uh, minorities, uh, whether those who are historically have been in a strong position, like the Jews, I represent a Jewish family, namely the Rothschild, or even the Muslims, the way they were able to gather themselves, you know, define themselves as Arab Americans or what have you, and really create, represent a voice, and they had a voice. Um, I was never, frankly speaking, terribly impressed by diversity in philanthropy. Frankly speaking, in France, it's the same thing. I mean, it's probably even worse. But here, all, I won't name the foundations, but the same profile, the same Ivy League schools, uh, same approach and same way of thinking, which I think is at times dangerous because it's, it's so powerful that actually they cultivate their own uh, discourse. Because we are weaker in, uh, as I said before, in Europe, we have to sort of really try to push the boundaries and seek you know, people's help, including the, the state. I would say that today my mindset has changed. And you know, with all due respect, uh, what I see today in America is frightening. Um, in the sense of, uh, I don't see anymore like I did six years ago. You know, the, the voices of so-called minorities, and especially that Islam has become part of the whole equation, as strong today as it was, let's say, five years ago. The people that I know are damn scared when I see personal friends in New York who used to wear the hijab and now don't want to wear the hijab anymore and replace it by some sort of very elegant bonnet or whatever because of the fear of being attacked. And we're not in Texas here, we are in New York City. That's frightening. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I would also say that uh, as compared to that, my, my, my approach to France has a, a, a changed a little bit because in many ways, France is as much exposed to this, um, you know, this retrenchment mentality, the fact that the whole of Europe is actually very much going right-wing retrenchment, a sort of imagine, imagine concept of what European identity once was. But by the same token, there's also a sense of, um, of uh, uh, a sense of humility of, of saying, okay, well, but I'm still very dogmatic about laicity and so on, but I think there's now openings. There's a, there's a sense of recognition that it is not correct that a third generation French people born in France are called immigrants. Uh, uh, you talk about immigrants, but when you talk about immigrants in America, I'm sure you talk about recent immigration. In France, you talk about immigrants that sort of grandparents came from Algeria. And if I may be bold with you, these kids don't care about colonization. They couldn't care less. It's not that it's not the battle anymore. So from a historical standpoint, yes, France should continue recognizing the whole Algeria, but when I, when I deal with those kids with Rashid, you know, those brilliant kids,
kids who are telling me, I'm tired of when I, uh, when I apply for a role, uh, I'm a beautiful black woman, and I will be offered the role of a soubrette ou une soubrette or a servant in Molière, in Femme Savante. <laughs> or my name is uh, Mohammed, so I'm going to be a caïd, okay. uh, in, uh, in some you know, contemporary production. Um, but but where, hope, where there's a hope and still where a foundation we play a role is to allow this voice to emerge. And I don't think it was the case uh, uh, five or six years ago. So are we, are we, is the foundation encouraging civil war? Maybe, but that's also our war. Thank you so much, Which is that uh, you said that um, I might have been referring to um, recent immigration. America is a, a country of immigrants um, starting with the West and Europeans. And, uh, the, you know, and so it's slightly different from the European um, immigrant uh, perspective, I think. Um, Thank you so much for your yeah. And maybe we can yes. wrap that in the Q&A. I just want to ask you one follow-up question, Rashid, before we open it up, which is about your role as a choreographer. Um, of course, there were two previous nights of performances, another one this evening, for those who are able to come, thank you for, in the middle of all of that, being here with us, um, taking a break from Ordinary Witness. But there was a way in which, in your description, and your use of the word mechanism and habits, um, that I actually saw something choreographic in the way that you're approaching these social questions. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see your role as an artist and as a choreographer and also as somebody who's directing a center coming together or being separate? Um, I'm a young director of an institution okay. and I'm still trying to make that work. But, but yeah, it's true that I'm trying to understand through all the practice, we have, uh, everything we have done in the past with the company, how it can feed an institution. Mm. I think that's what interests me as an artist, coming from that field, focusing on movement, and on bodies and bodies in space. It's, it's not so much to digest the history of dance, but it's just to see how I can share to emphasize even more our diversity and to put people on stage that we are not so used to see. Um, sometimes because of their cultural sign, sometimes because of their physical aspect. Um, then, then that's it. That's a very simple thing. Uh, but at the same time, it helps me to to analyze and to understand our potential to perceive the diversity. Because diversity is, I think that during many years I was naive enough to do believe that diversity was a richness that we all appreciate and that we all perceive. And I just realized that, uh, yeah, when we, some, there is some invisible people around us. There is people that we don't see for who they are, for what they can bring, for what they express. Even when they express something, we assign them their, an identity and we locate, uh, we, we lock uh, everything about what they are doing. Then, um, then yeah, I'm trying to do that in our institution at the moment. I'm trying just to, to make come people and to find a way of expression of people um, and to try to valorize and to be sure that what they are expressing is perceived. And sometimes it's by res resetting our own history. I join you, Firoz, when you say that uh, it's true that I don't know if it's uh, bad or wrong, but it's, uh, it's a tricky thing to always refer to an uh, official history. Like, I like to make this joke. Sometimes people come close to me and say, Rashid, um, you know, I, um, I think we have something in common. I, your name is uh, Urandan, and uh, I'm coming from a land which is close to yours. And I like to say, ah, oh, you mean the French Alp near Geneva? <laughs> and, you know, that's all the phantasm. And it's, uh, it's, 
I did a lot of project, and I think that's a diff uh, focusing on history, official history. And I think we, the difference between history and memory, it's how we are all dealing in a different way with official fact. But we know that we all have a different relation, and the combinations of what shape our identity. One more time, I think it's a labyrinth. And um, that's maybe what I'm trying to do in this new ins institution. Uh, it's just to relativize the way we assign identities just by proposing experience that I do hope will force people to, to question themselves about how they consider those people, how they watch a disabled person, how they watch someone that holds his difference more than others. Uh, because some people have a difference which is more visible than others. And uh, sometimes this difference is aggressive, sometimes we have compassion for this difference. Then that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to do at the moment, just to, to create an art place where we are just forced to perceive what makes us different. Great. So I'd like to invite Patrick Vey to the stage. Um, please take the seat. I'll just move over here. Um, and we'll open it up for questions. There'll be folks coming around on either, on either side um, to, to take your questions. And we have time for a couple of questions. So just raise your hand, and these two lovely individuals will come to take your question. Question right here. All right. Yes, hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for that. Um, just a quick question I have, actually. You talked about the sort of lack of diversity that exists in audiences and so forth uh, in France, as well as perhaps here, and also the uh, philanthropic uh, uh, institutions as well. Um, does diversity always reflect in race and culture uh, or religion? Uh, is it not true to say that identity is also shaped by environmental factors, social upbringing, and so forth, and that saying that if someone is not of a particular different culture, then they're not necessarily sensitive to that. So could you comment on that, perhaps? Um, yes, it's, it's um, one of the programs which um, we have uh, developed in, uh, in France with the, um, the Paris uh, Art School, which is probably the most prestigious uh, art school in France, was not only looking at um, the exposure that kids coming from lesser advantaged neighborhoods, uh, uh, how to actually build that bridge, but also their families. And uh, this was a partnership we created between the school, ourselves, and a city near, near Paris called saint Paul, which by the way is communist. So Rothschild and communist, we love it. We bring it <laughs> uh, and, uh, and to answer your question, one of the most extraordinary moments was actually where we were able to actually bring those families, we're talking about 500 families, to see the work of those kids uh, that they had actually developed with their own tutors from the Beaux-Arts. And whether you like it or not, there is definitely um, uh, a crossing between ethnic or religious background and socioeconomic uh, exposure. So I don't want to generalize, but generally I would say that uh, that a lot of um, poverty in France does come, but not only. I'm talking about the volume. I'm not talking about rural France, for instance. What you like? No, which is a totally different story altogether. But at least the volume, the neighborhoods, the um, how do you put it? suburbs, suburbs are made with a lot of people who are, let's say, non-white. <coughs> so you, you and so, of course, these people are not the ones that are going to, to, that you're going to be uh, seeing in, in the theater, including including Grenoble. Um, it, it's as if, and this, this is the mindset, but we're also trying to change it, that this is also their culture. As you said, it's not because you go to Rashid that you're going to look back at what your grandfather did in Algeria. You are from Grenoble, and your reference is the French, uh, the French house. So it's a, all, these are also the type of, uh, while we value culture from the outside, the idea is not necessarily to only pro promote what is coming from ailleurs, but also what is yours should be yours. Yeah. Definitely, I think that the French culture is layers of, um, um, comment dire, 
J'ai l'impression qu'il faut juste faire un scan de, de notre culture pour pouvoir vraiment avoir accès à la culture qui nous constitue et enfin pouvoir dire ce que nous sommes. Parce qu'effectivement, souvent quand on parle de diversité, on parle des premiers signes de la diversité, les choses. Mais c'est vrai que travailler sur la diversité en France, euh, sur le public, d'une part, et, mais aussi des, 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 des pratiques des amateurs qui ne, vont, qui ne sont pas toujours du public, c'est-à-dire des populations qui s'intéressent à la culture sans être un public. Il y a tout un travail à faire pour vraiment enfin prendre conscience de l'ensemble des, des mélanges qui construisent la stratification culturelle française. Et qui est ce labyrinthe de classe sociale, classe ethnique, rattachement religieux. Je sais pas si Yes, I would like to insist on the incredible opportunity given by new technologies um, to permit to circulate a cultural creation. With my NGO, we are developing, we are deploying portable cultural center in refugee camps all over the world. We started in Burundi, and there was some of the refugees created their own movie expressing the trauma not of being terrorized as a risk of being killed, but because they were part of the killers, in fact, who killed some other people. Mm -hmm. And they, wrote, they created, they wrote a scenario, and they produced a film. And we have others in Jordan who are writing poetry. And we are working in the Indian reservation, where kids are interviewing the elderly to transmit, to have a record of the history of the tribe and transmit the language of the tribe world, 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 which risk to disappear, etc. This is incredible. I mean, with small technology, with a small, short, small uh, cost, we can permit people to create cultural, you know, to create culture. But the issue is then, and I think as I'm speaking to the foundation, is how do you ensure the circulation? How do you permit this creation to be accessible through new means of access that the, that the new technology permit? And I think, for example, local library could be places where people record their experience, their memoirs, the family memoirs. You can make the local library the place where you would record the story of the people living around. You have a lot of innovation that can be, that would permit to explore the monopolies of big institutions in the United States. I, I would like to build on your point. Um, it just sparked a thought in me that um, in terms of distribution um, and getting the story out, about a particular peoples. I'm, I'm reminded of what happened on, um, on Thursday in my office where um, a, a strategic communications team came in to uh, train some of our grantees to give them training in uh, communications and uh, messaging and so on. And in the break, um, one team member from this communications um, uh, firm said, uh, you know, she was Muslim and she said, American Muslim, and she said, you know, um, this whole thing with surveillance, it's really getting to me. I think that we should start a hashtag called Muslims Reporting Things. <laughs> and on Sunday was the debate, the presidential debate, and at 9.03, Zainab Chaudhry sent out a tweet that had the hashtag Muslims Reporting Things. And by the time Trump came to answer the question of the young Muslim woman towards the end of the debate, Twitter lit up, and 
you know, Reza Aslan said, uh, um, you don't want to know what we put in hummus, Muslims reporting things. <laughs> and uh, Mustafa Bayoumi from Brooklyn College uh, put out a famous tweet, now famous, which said, uh, I'm a Muslim and I'd like to report that there's a crazy man terrorizing a woman on the stage in Missouri. <laughs> and an Iranian-American put out a tweet that said, um, my dad's napping, I'm reporting, as you said, I'll keep watching him, Muslims reporting things. And so uh, with the injection of humor, it humanized Muslims and it told stories in a very haiku form, this, this Twitter <coughs> form of um, the story got out and it went global. And I think these, these micro-blogging sites, these new technologies are really supporting a movement uh, of distribution and storytelling and civic action. So I, I hope that um, the Native American project that you have um, will find its way on, onto some of these micro sites and get stories. So we have time for one last question. Yes, Um, first off, yes. uh, thank you for a very interesting conversation, but I wanted to address your very first point about equity. If we look at it from an economic standpoint, isn't equity about power and influence? And so a problem that we have with diversity is that people don't have access to it. And that goes back to education, like you were saying about philanthropy, that it's full of white, rich men. And maybe that's because, so far, there isn't a lot of, if I'm going to be very <coughs> blunt, <laughs> but maybe that's because we're not seeing um, so-called minorities in positions of power, and that goes back to, again, education. And also, uh, you are a choreographer, and I dance for fun ballet, but when I say that to people, they go, oh, ballet, and they have this idea that it's elitist. So I'm wondering to the panelists, how do we create access to culture? So it doesn't matter if you're from a poor family in the Bronx or you go to an Ivy League school such as Harvard, you see, you have access to whether it's dance or theater or movies. And, and Twitter is great, but there's also a danger in Twitter that if people say, oh, this is the hashtag, if you don't agree with that, some people have been absolutely, you know, their lives have been destroyed on Twitter. So I guess my question is, how do we change so people have access to hear, have their voice heard? Because ultimately it's about influence and money and philanthropy is great, but how do we change it so it isn't just rich people creating projects, but this is a uh, you know, a um, basic human right to know how to write a resume and so forth, because I don't think that's the case at the moment. So let me be short. When Mangio acted at the request of the librarians of Haiti after the earthquake of 2010, we looked at the UN guidelines about what to do in humanitarian crisis. There were, of course, provided priority was for health, food, shelters, etc. There was nothing, no mention of culture. <coughs> so we launched a petition that got nine Nobel Prize of Literature, 15 Pulitzer Prize, French Academy, etc., to make access to culture, one of the basic human rights. So I think we should, of course, we have to start at the at the, low, at the individual level, but also we have to change the world guidelines, saying access to culture after you save the life should be the first priority in all the world institution uh, guidelines. And we have created the ideas box for that, but it's not enough. We should resume the advocacy to make it a basic human right Recognize, I and mean, if it is recognized, it will come it, with foundings and uh, all the things people have to fulfill when they want to get, uh, you know, 
the backing of big institutions. And just maybe one thing. Um, I think also that, uh, and to go back to this way to try to analyze mechanism, instead of having in mind that culture is something that costs and what would be the accessible, how can I access to something that costs? For example, in Grenoble is what we are trying to do. That's why I, 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 want, I really wanted to make the difference between public and audience and practitioners, des, des, des gens qui ont un usage culturel, which are a, to, to, yeah, and to be a public uh, is part of it. But then, this is one thing, but no, um, for example, I'm trying to bring the culture in the field of art. Then I go to not to the, then people through art therapy. We are not trying to get people to, the, to, to make them come to culture. We are, uh, in France, uh, two years ago, we had a huge uh, reform, uh, reform uh, 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 at school for the children. And now we don't know what to do. I mean, I'm going super fast. Now. But we don't know what to do with the children from uh, four to six. Then we decide to, to, to put dance practice, a program of dance which means that because we're in France, because a lot of people have an access to school, we don't have to think about it, there is a lot of, it means that those people are in contact with culture and it will not cost. Then one more time, it's also the mechanism where do we implant cultural practice uh, wh which kind of economical model, not financial economical model, but different way to be to, sh to share practice that make uh, those people to have an access to culture. So I think we're going to end on that. No, we can continue the conversation outside, but I'd like to ask you all to join me in thanking our incredible panelists. Thank you to. <laughs>